أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I start in the name of Allah the beneficent and the merciful and I seek salvation from shaitan the accursed Dearest viewers my brothers and sisters from all across the globe Assalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May the peace blessings and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you all at all times Welcome to a new episode of the Ramadan show with me your host Dr. Shabir Tijani once again in today's episode we'll be going through all the different facets of Ramadan to be your one-stop shop for the holy month I would like to remind you once again to join us on social media on Twitter using the hashtag IHTV Ramadan on Instagram on Facebook and on YouTube as well please also send in your videos from wherever you live across the world so that we may be able to air it. Before proceeding to the show, I wanted to just quote a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, where he says, one hour of contemplation is equivalent to 70 years of worship. And inshallah, this should be one of our aims during the holy month, to contemplate, to think, to ponder over our lives and reassess our lives at every step of the way. This episode, the specific trait that we'll be focusing on, or the specific area that we'll be talking about for spiritual refinement, is called spiritual wayfaring, or the journey through the spiritual life, essentially the journey for attaining spirituality. Because if we look at life as a whole, our life should be the embodiment or the reflection of all the positive traits of humanity, the traits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of these examples are Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, Latif, Rauf, and so forth. The first step towards achieving spiritual wayfaring is to be aware and to acknowledge the being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have faith in Him and to believe in his messenger and his Ahlul Bayt because the Ahlul Bayt are the ones who have given us guidance they're the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this planet and have been sent down as guides for us to learn from them so that's why we should look to them in order to give us guidance one of the greatest scholars of our time who discussed spiritual wayfaring in much detail is Allah Matabatabai in his book Lub Al Lubab. He talks about different stages of the process, and these stages have been set out in very specific terms. The first one is called Islam, belief in the religion, Iman, faith, Tawakkul, giving your putting all your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Jihad and Nafs, etc. etc. But the initial stage of achieving spiritual enlightenment or starting on that journey towards spiritual enlightenment is yaqadda, which is to awaken the soul. An example of this is uh, Hur alayhi salam, when he on the night of Ashura came to Imam al-Hussein, something in his soul awoke and he realized his mistake and therefore he began that path towards spiritual enlightenment and we can all achieve this because our souls as long as they have the ability to tell right from wrong and good from evil have the potential to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go upon the spiral towards perfection because you see as human beings we're very complex creatures 
not, not only physically but spiritually as well. We hear that if an individual achieves spiritual enlightenment, is able to tell right from wrong and does all the good deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked him to do, his status is higher than that of the angels. However, if he becomes the opposite where his soul is so shrunken, where it's so darkened and it is completely overruled by his nafs or their nafs, they become worse than the animals. They, they succumb to their animalistic desires, their materialistic lusts and therefore they are even worse than the animals. The first step, as we've said, is the ability to enlighten the soul and that begins with a belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believers are constantly looking at every test and trial as not a test and a trial but mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because true believers know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only tests you or challenges you in order to make you a better human being in order for you to come closer to Him because every single thing that happens in our life is planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for us to achieve that enlightenment. Now it is up to us whether we take on that test or that challenge and it is up to us whether we want to achieve that closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because by God everyone is capable of achieving enlightenment as long as you have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put all of your pains and anguishes and all of the, 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 the burdens of your soul and your heart and leave it up to, to, up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease those burdens. Surely that is the first step towards achieving the enlightenment. We look towards the Ahlul Bayt, we look towards the Prophets to give us enlightenment or to give us guidance in these specific areas of how to achieve this spiritual enlightenment. We see that Amir al-Mu'mineen, despite being faced with so many challenges during his lifetime, even though he knew that he was the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth and he was the next in line after the Holy Prophet, we see that his rights were usurped. Yet even those who usurped his rights knew that he was the most knowledgeable person of his time and he was the human reflection of the Holy Qur'an. Next, we go on to another trait that Amir al-Mu'mineen shows us during his lifetime and that is to keep steadfast with prayers. We see in so many occasions in the battlefield where Amir al-Mu'mineen stops in battle and fulfills his obligations towards prayer. We see that he is the only person in the history of mankind to give zakat in, during prostration. Imam Ali salam shows us that this is the first step, first physical thing we can do towards achieving enlightenment and that is to keep steadfast with our prayers. And taking that forward, how can we take practical steps to achieve this perfection? As always I've mentioned before and I'll mention again, Niyyah is the first and most important thing. Niyyah is not a stagnant thing though, you have to constantly reassess your Niyyah and your intention. It can be something as simple as going to the shops or, or going out into, into town, visiting friends. You see Shaitan is around us at all times and he has promised that he will try and drag us away from the path of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to constantly reassess our intentions, constantly reassess our surroundings, reassess our actions and our actions should be made on a scaffold. The first part of that scaffold is taqwa. When you have taqwa you realize yourself as what you actually are and that is nothing except an abd, a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is when you think of that, you actually bring yourself down to earth, you become humble and shed your heart of pride and arrogance. Taqwa begins from inside oneself. You take steps, slow steps towards achieving the spiritual enlightenment that you want to achieve. After all, they say that a, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And it is true, even for this spiritual path, 
that if you want to achieve that ultimate enlightenment, never be afraid to take that first step and always start with taqwa. And you have to ask yourself, how close are you to God? How, how close do you feel to God in your day-to-day -day life? Do you talk to God? When you pray to God, do you actually envision that you are actually in the presence of God? Do you actually feel that you're in the presence of God? And it is only when you get to that stage do you begin on this long path towards enlightenment. Then a lot of people ask me, ask, ask a lot of scholars, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really loves us and He wishes what's best for us, why do we suffer? Why is there so much suffering in this world? Why is there suffering within our own communities and within our own households? And why do we have inflictions within our own lives? And the answer can be broken down to many facets. The first one obviously is trials and tribulations that you inflict upon yourself due to the consequences of your own actions. And for that, you have no one, but, no one to blame but yourself. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that your sins are actually a barrier between Him and yourself. And when you commit sins, you take yourself away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result, you can be faced with suffering and trials, not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates you, but because He wants you to become more aware that in fact you need His nearness at all times in your life. And this leads on to my next thing. Sometimes trials and tribulations are to make yourself aware where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to make yourself aware and self-conscious about the type of person you are. He wants you to achieve a higher station within His eyes and also within your own soul. And sometimes we see that the worst experiences can have the most positive impacts on our lives because these, these negative experiences actually take us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we learn from them. And finally, like I've said before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when his abd, when his servant comes towards him. And sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us just to see if we will thank him for whatever we have. And he wants to see that we actually have one of the most important qualities of spiritual enlightenment within us and that is sabr, patience. When we look at our day-to-day -day practical lives, we see the relationship between a student and a teacher. And it is very similar to that between us and our Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't test us because He doesn't like us or He hates us or He's got bad intentions for us. It is because He wants to see how far we are able to come towards His path. Sometimes it takes an event, an experience to take you out of your comfort zone where you actually understand the, the, the strength of your own character and it's only when you understand what you're capable of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes closer to you and you become closer to Him. And finally, I just want to get towards the, the main reason that we in this day and age need to try and achieve spiritual enlightenment and that is because we are the generation that are awaiting our 12th Imam alayhi salam, Imam al-Mahdi why is it so important in this day and age to become one of those who will have closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Many reasons. Firstly, in this day and age, this generation that we live in, the influence of shaitan is more than any other time in history. Wherever we look, there is bloodshed. There is attractions towards this worldly desires, this, these materialistic lusts. Shaitan is around us at every turn. Whether you live in the West or the East, whether you're in a Muslim country or a non-Muslim country, shaitan is around us at all times. Secondly, we're trying to achieve enlightenment, spiritual growth in preparation for the Imam. Because don't forget, the Imam is waiting for us. Not only are we waiting for him, but he's waiting for us as well. He's waiting to see if we're prepared for him, whether we'll stand by his side and part of this preparation is achieving that spiritual refinement and that enlightenment. Finally, I want to just take your minds towards Karbala. 
Because you see, spiritual enlightenment, enlightenment and this journey isn't a stagnant journey. It isn't just a, a simple road which you'll go by. There'll be many obstacles along that path. There may be rocks and other forms of obstacles which you must overcome. And when we look to the Ahl al-Bayt, we see no greater example than the day of Ashura and the story of Imam al Hussein in Karbala, where he sacrifices his whole family and he sacrifices his own life. And in the end, when we see him being martyred, we see that he's actually prostrating to God, thanking him for his mercies and thanking him for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him. And this is the level of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we must try and achieve. Like I've said, there are many paths, many stages towards the achievement of this enlightenment and many, many, many miles along this road towards enlightenment. There will be obstacles, there is no doubt, but we must try and get there. I request all of you to read the book that I have talked about in this, in this segment because inshallah I pray that as a society, as a community, we can also achieve enlightenment. After all, we are from that generation into which the Imam inshallah will come and the first step towards preparing for him is, in, is awakening our souls, awakening ourselves and to realize that this awakening isn't just a stagnant process, it's a continuous refined process and it's an active process in which we must partake. So inshallah I pray for all of us and our communities, our society that inshallah we can be amongst the companions of the awaited Imam alayhi salam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, Eight Ramadan is the month whose beginning is mercy, its middle is forgiveness, and its end is emancipation or liberation from the hellfire. For this episode, as we go around the world and visit places across, across the globe, we want to have an insight into how people run and perform their day-to-day -day duties and day-to-day -day lives during the month of Ramadan. Today, we're going to be looking at the country of Sweden. For those of you who don't know where Sweden is, what Sweden is, have never visited that part of the world, Sweden is in northern Europe, in an area called Scandinavia. The beauty of this place and the harsh reality of this place is that for a lot of the time of the year it's extremely cold there and during the summertime the hours of daylight are very long and during the winter the hours of nighttime are very long. This in itself raises a unique test, a unique problem for those who live in those countries because their hours of daylight can, be, can vary from time to time depending on the time of year that Ramadan is. So for example this year they will only get maybe two or three hours of uh, darkness in which they can have their food, they can have their iftar and the suhoor. In a non-Muslim country like Sweden, the problem with that is that you cannot alter your day-to-day -day working hours because they do not allow you to do that. So essentially what individuals have to do is try to adapt their day-to-day -day lives in order to try and get the most out of the month of Ramadan. From my research and from people who I've spoken to, I have come across some people who live in Stockholm, in the capital of Sweden. Stockholm is obviously a very vibrant and multicultural area where there's a lot of Muslims, non-Muslims, and people from other religions and denominations. But for the Muslims, there are many different types, uh, for the Shia rather, they're from different backgrounds. So you have your Arabs, North Africans, your um, Indian and subcontinent 
uh, uh, people from the Indian subcontinent as well. And they both, they all prepare for the month of Ramadan, for iftar specifically, in slightly different ways. The day-to-day -day life entails work, as it is for majority of the countries in the Western world. And the hours of work don't actually change. The challenge comes after work and during the time of day up to iftar, because iftar can be very late at night, it can be as late as 11 o'clock at night. So for these people, they try to make sure that when it's iftar time, they nourish themselves appropriately and they give themselves enough time to eat for the three hours. So they try to eat slow and steady for the full time, for the full allotted three hours or however long they've got for iftar. In the Khoja community or the Indian communities, they tend to have iftar in the mosques. They tend to go for the mosque for specific programs, for majlis, for du'a, and then they'd have iftar with, after uh, Salat al-Maghrib. For the Arab communities there, it's slightly different. They have iftar at home, they have it amongst their families and their close communities. And after that, the men of the family tend to go to the mosque and to partake in special amal or du'a and for, uh, for prayers as well. So it varies from community to community and from person to person. Obviously, at this time of the year where the, where the um, daylight hours are so long, it's a unique challenge for these individuals, for these people, and for them to fast during these times of the year, it can be quite challenging. So for a lot of people, they tend to try and take medical advice and to take the right sort of foods at the right times during the, the, the iftar period from iftar to suhoor. And obviously during the day-to-day -day lives after work, they try to take some rest, sleep for some time because obviously during the night time, they'd be awake until the time of Salat al-Fajr. Other than that, for these individuals, for these Muslims, the winter time is also quite challenging because it gets very, very cold. And due to the, uh, the, the fasting and the hunger, as your body, the metabolic rate in the body drops, the cold tends to affect you more. So during the winter months, when it's fasting, they tend to be very, very cold. But the benefit that they have is that the daylight hours are a lot shorter. And this is the same for many countries across the Scandinavian region and also other parts of the world where it remains cold during the winter and, and during the summer the, the daylight hours are very long. As I've said before during these episodes, during these shows, we look forward for you to send in your videos. Please let us see how you prepare for the month of Ramadan, how you prepare your day-to-day -day lives, how you go about doing your working you, your working day-to-day -day lives and how you prepare iftar in the evenings and how your day-to-day -day lives vary from country to country, from place to place across the globe. I hope that this will enable us to come together as a community to get an insight into each other's lives and inshallah join and make our bond of brotherhood and sisterhood stronger. Rahim. Dearest Imam Hussein TV viewers, welcome to Imam Hussein TV 3. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you, and all your prayers and supplications be accepted in the holy month of Ramadan. Today, we came to one of the restaurants in the holy city of Karbala to show you the atmosphere of the holy month of Ramadan in this specific restaurant. This is one of the examples of the restaurants that we have here in the holy city of Karbala. So stay tuned as we go inside and have a word with the brothers inside. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, welcome 
I have one of the brothers here. I will ask him a few questions for you. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Ramadan mubarak al imam islami kulla jamian. Allah yisalamak. Mungkin تعرفنا بنفسك وتشرح لنا عن الوضعية هنا خلال شهر رمضان. تكرم علينا. الأستاذ منزير أبو نور مدير صلاة مطعم إيوان السياحي بكربلاء المقدسي. طبعا. هلا رمضان في شغلة حلوة إنه بيختلف عن الأيام العادية. الأيام العادية فاتحين إحنا مدار النهار 24 ساعة بنقدم جميع الوجبات بكل التفاصيل بكل الأوقات بجميع النوعيات. بس رمضان بيختلف إنه له وقت معين. يعني أنت محصور بوقت معين لتقوم بتقديم وجباتك بأسرع وقت وأفضل نوعية مشان إرضاء الزبون والصائم ما بيتحملك لازم تكون أنت أسرع منه دائما مشان تقدم أحسن شيء لك وأحسن وجبة بقل فترة الأفطار والوضع برمضان يعني نحن نفتح من تقريبا على الستة ستة ونص نحن نكون جاهزين طبعا بكل النوعيات الأكل والشرب والمقبلات وكل الأمور يعني على السبعة تقريبا فاتحين الباب مستقبلين اي زبون بيجي وبالنسبه للوجبات بس الزبون يقعد يعني مباشره نحن عاملين بهي الفتره مقدمين وجبه نحن مو بوفيه الوجبه كثير كويسه بحيث انه الزبون ما يتعب نحن عاملين مشان راحه الزبون لا يقوم يسكب ولا شيء هو قاعد كمان بلاقي كل اموره جاهزه بكميه كبيره ونوعيه كثير جيده بفتره كثير وجيزه يعني I ask a brother Munder, he is congratulating you and the Islamic Ummah on the arrival of the holy month of Ramadan. He is the manager of E1 restaurant here in the holy city of Karbala. He is saying that the holy month of Ramadan totally differs from the, the other month of the year. Uh, during the year, the normal days, uh, they are open 24 hours a day and they serve uh, three meals, like breakfast, dinner and lunch, with different uh, specifications. But in the holy month of Ramadan, uh, they open shortly only for iftar. Uh, that's because people are fasting here. Uh, so he's saying that um, during the iftar time, we open usually uh, half an hour uh, before the iftar time. We try uh, to open the doors and receive uh, our guests. Uh, they, they usually prepare everything uh, about one hour before the time of iftar. So they make it fast for the, for the visitors to come and take their meals. اوكي استاذ منذر ممكن تفضل لنا بعد الاماكن البقيه اللي عندكم هنا بداخل هذا المطعم تكرم عينك هلا بعد ما شرحت لك على الفطائر قسم الفطائر في عندي قسم ثاني هو المقبلات هي عارضه يقوم بتجهيز المقبلات في قسم اخر فوق المطبخ عندنا مطبخين مطبخ داخلي ومطبخ بالاعلى يعني بنقوم بتجهيز كميه كبيره من المقبلات ما يعادل شيء 14 ل 16 نوع من تشكيله اطباق مقبلات سوريه مع عراقي دمج شيء مرتب يعني وفي قسم اخر هو البار بنقدم فيه نحن المشروبات والعصائر والايس كريم وكل شيء بيتطلبه الزبون من مشروبات حاره وبارده وبعدين بيجيك عندك قسم الساخن بتقدم فيه كل المأكولات الساخنه بكل اشكالها كرمان اي اس براذر اباوت ذا اذر بارتس اوف ذا ريستورانت هي سينج ذات ذي هاف ا فيرنس هير ذي هاف ديفرنت انذر هول ذي هاف ا سبيسيفيك بليس وير ذي سيرف جوس اند هوت تيز اند سو اون and they have a specific place for the appetizers. So stay tuned with us as we go in, uh, inside the restaurant and see the other parts. In this segment of the show, where we talk about health and medical advice, I want to continue with what we've been talking about in the past few shows, where we've been talking about risk factors for heart disease. And inshallah, today I want to talk about heart attacks themselves. Firstly, we'll talk about risk factors and things you should look out for. 
ways you can modify your life. And also I want to talk about the symptoms of a heart attack and what things you should look out for before you get concerned. In the previous shows we've talked about risk factors such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, diabetes, a stressful lifestyle that can be precursors or predispositions to getting heart attacks and heart disease. Another thing that you must, well, there's other things that you cannot control which are also risk factors for heart disease and those are things like a family history of heart attacks. And for this you can't do much other than, than um, modify your lifestyle to cut out the risk factors that you can change. As I've said in the previous episodes that we should try and control our blood sugar levels, try and control our cholesterol levels, whether it's through a healthy lifestyle or if that's not possible through medication. And I've also talked about ways to improve our lifestyle to avoid getting stressed because stress is one of the commonest causes over a prolonged period of time that can actually lead to heart disease. Family history obviously is one of the things you cannot control as I've mentioned before. And for you, for, for you as an individual, if you do have a family history of heart disease, it's ever more important to be aware of the symptoms of heart attacks. Before I go into the symptoms, I want to talk a little bit about how heart attacks are caused and why we get the symptoms that we get when we have heart attacks. Essentially what heart, a heart attack is, is when the supply of oxygen to the heart muscle is stopped or reduced for whatever reason. People who have many, many risk factors for heart disease and some people who don't even have any risk factors for heart disease, what happens is that they have clogging or blockages of their coronary arteries over a prolonged period of time. This can be due to things such as um, the risk factors I mentioned, people with inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or, or lupus can also develop um, blockages of the coronary arteries and other important blood vessels in the body. And after the coronary artery is blocked, the blood which is supposed to go through the coronary, coronary artery and supply the muscle which helps the heart to pump gets blocked and as a result the oxygen that's in the blood does not get to the muscle of the heart and that piece of muscle dies and when that piece of muscle dies the heart's contractility decreases and the heart cannot pump the blood out because the muscle that's doing the pumping action is now closed or dead. So what happens to a human being when they're in that situation? Firstly there are people who suffer from something called angina. Angina is before heart attacks. So in people who have risk factors for heart disease, they can develop minor blockages of their coronary arteries and stop some of the blood from getting through to the heart muscle. And in these people, even though oxygen is getting through, not enough of it is getting through. So they find that when they go for a walk or they exert themselves, because the oxygen demands around the rest of the body increase due to the um, work of the muscles, they tend to um, not be able to supply enough oxygen to the heart muscle to get that pumping action going. And as a result, they have chest pain because when the heart muscle is deprived of oxygen, it releases certain chemicals which cause pain in the chest. And that's why they get angina. And when they rest, the angina symptoms subside. In people who suffer from angina, it's very, very important that you see a doctor as soon as possible because if you're suffering from those symptoms, it can be the first sign that you've got an impending catastrophic heart condition coming up. It can be a precursor to going on to develop a full-blown heart attack. And you must control the symptoms that you have by going to see a doctor and getting started on, on certain medication. However, in people who develop full-blown blockages and end up having heart attacks, because there is no, uh, no pumping action or no muscle that is still alive to cause the pumping of the blood around the body, what happens is that your body realizes this and it goes into what we call shutdown mode. So if the blood pressure isn't adequate enough to supply the body or if your heart's not pumping enough around the body, your body actually conserves the blood into your central system and you get a, a surge of adrenaline around your body and as a result you get very cold peripherally and you also start sweating a lot and you go pale because the blood supply to your skin is diminished. As a result, the blood is only left 
for your major organs such as your brain, your heart and for your kidneys. And often the symptoms that people who have had heart attacks, the symptoms they get are obviously chest pain, they get pain down the left arm because some of the nerves that supply the heart also supply that side of the body so they get what we call referred pain to either the arm, the shoulder or the jaw or even the teeth sometimes. Other symptoms they get is nausea because with um, severe pain in the chest and also that surge of adrenaline you can become very nauseous and feel sick. Also they do get, like I've said, sweating, they, get, they feel very pale and due to the decreased blood supply to the brain they can sometimes have faints. So any of these symptoms should be a very, very important sign, a very important symptom to get seen immediately. Go and see, you go straight to the emergency department if you get any of these symptoms. Also, if you're at home with someone who has got these symptoms and could have a heart attack, it's very important to know what to do in that situation. As doctors, we're told that if we are concerned that anyone has a heart attack or they're suffering from any of these symptoms, we usually give them 300 milligrams of aspirin, usually in crushed form. And we tell the patient to take that medication because the sooner you give the aspirin, studies have shown that the better the prognosis is of the heart attack. Also, in people who suffer from heart attacks, it is very important to know what happens next. Having worked in a, in a cardiology job before, I have dealt with people who've had heart attacks. So there's many ways of treating them. If it's uh, a, pa a patient who is not suitable for um, uh, angioplasty due to many conditions or many problems, sometimes we would treat these people with blood thinners and we would try and reduce their risk factors as much as possible just with medication. In other people, they get taken to a cath lab and we've, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of stents, people having stents. For people who have stents put in, usually these stents are there and last for many years, but the biggest risk with these stents, due to their structure, is that they can get occluded again. And due to that, many people are on long-term antiplatelet therapy. Your doctor, obviously, your cardiologist will tell you exactly how long to take your antiplatelet therapy for. And the type of antiplatelet therapy differs from country to country from region to region, even in the country that I work in. And it is very important to take heed of the advice that the cardiologist gives you. For people who are unable to have stents for whatever reason, whether the blockage is too big, whether you have several blockages or it's affecting the main root of the coronary artery, for them, sometimes we, they have a coronary artery bypass graft or a cabbage. And for that, what happens is that you get seen by the cardiovascular or cardiothoracic surgeons rather, and they sometimes take a vein from your leg and rewire the coronary arteries around your heart in order to get the blood supply around the heart but without actually taking out the, the, the coronary arteries that are actually blocked and without compromising the blood circulation system so that all the muscles in the heart can receive the adequate oxygen and blood supply. For people who do have this bypass graft is very important to speak to your surgeon before the operation to find out exactly what complications you can have before, uh, so during the operation, immediately after the operation and also the long term because the, if you do have a, an, a, a bypass graft you will be, you'll have to spend a specific amount of time in hospital, you won't be able to drive, you may not be able to fly for a specific amount of time. So it's very important to be aware of all of these things and plan your life around it. Finally, in people who have had heart disease and heart problems, it is important to know what happens next. If a lot of your heart has been affected, sometimes you can end up with something called heart failure. Heart failure isn't, doesn't mean that your heart has completely failed. It just means that the efficiency of the pumping mechanism of your heart isn't as effective as it used to be many, many years ago before the heart attack because the part of the muscle of the heart is actually dead so it's not giving that contraction mechanism. Another effect of a heart attack can be that you can have problems with the conduction system of the heart. So as well as giving the pumping mechanism of the heart, the heart muscle is also part of the conduction system of the heart. So if you have a, a par part of the muscle that dies, the conduction system of the heart is also cut. So you can get 
conduction problems such as heart blocks or, or something called atrial fibrillation. Inshallah, I hope that this episode or this part of this episode has been useful for you. And I hope that if you do have any of these risk factors for heart disease, whether it's something you can change such as your lifestyle or whether it's something like your blood sugar levels, I would urge you to make those changes. And if it's things like your family history which you can't change, please try and make changes to those things that you can affect in order to lead a healthy lifestyle inshallah with a good healthy heart which will, which will allow you to have a good quality of life and a longevity of life inshallah. All societies in the past and the present have cultural practices of either benefit or harm. The ones of benefit Islam seeks to enhance and the ones of harm seeks to refuse, seeks to refute and leave alone. However, all societies contain cultural customs that may do harm more than good. For this reason, Islam seeks to change these customs. Once in the time of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he was traveling to Kufa and passed through Ambar in Iraq. The majority of the residents there were Persian farmers and when they heard about Imam Ali's arrival they went to go visit him. However when it was the time for Imam Ali to leave they began running in front of his horse and chanting. Seeing this was very difficult for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and he also knew that it was difficult for them as well because they, they, they accorded him a higher regard than he actually deserved. Because as we know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he has always positioned himself as the poorest, ate as the poorest and the most oppressed ones of society. He dressed the poorest and worked for a living just like anybody else. He asked, why should others lower themselves to honor me in this way? When Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib asked about this behavior, he was told that we have practiced this, this custom for years. This is how we show respect to a person of higher, of higher status. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib humbly and respectfully told them, this action makes you uncomfortable in this world and it brings you humiliation in the next. Always stay away from humiliating acts. And anyway, how does someone benefit from this action? As Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib show us, it is, uh, it is our responsibility and it is, it is upon us to always question our culture and societal practices seeking to elevate the best of them and refuting and moving away from the worst of them. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. today's episode, I want to dedicate the poem and the nasheed to the seal of the prophets, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This is a nasheed called the chosen one. And it's originally recited by Mahar Zain, so I'm sure a lot of you would know it at home. If you do, please join in. In the time of the time darkness and greed it is your it light is your that light we that need. We you came to you teach came us to how to live. Muhammad, Muhammad Ya Rasulullah, you were so, so caring and kind. Your soul your was soul full was of light. You are the you best, are the of, best mankind. of mankind. Muhammad, Khairu Khalqillah. Salu ala Rasulillah. Habib al Mustafa. Peace be upon the Messenger, the Chosen One. 
from luxury you turn away and all night you would pray truthful in every word you'd say Muhammad Ya Rasulullah Your face was brighter than the sun Your beauty equal by none You are Allah's chosen one Muhammad Khayr Khalqillah Mustafa, peace be upon the messenger, the chosen one. I try to follow your way and do my best to live my life. As you taught me, I pray to be close to you. Upon that day and see you smile. When you see me, salu ala Rasulillah, Habib al-Mustafa, peace be upon the messenger, the chosen one. Salu ala Rasulillah. Peace be upon the messenger, the chosen one. Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and his progeny, has said, Eight Ramadan is the month whose beginning is mercy, its middle is forgiveness, and its end is emancipation or liberation from the hellfire. As we end this episode of the Ramadan show, I wanted to part with the following thought, the following words, a philosophy that you can employ in your everyday lives to try and ascend towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those final words are that if things don't go your way, don't fret. Change the plan, but never change the objective, never change the goal. Surely, if we reassess our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, we will be able to reassess what we do in our actions. We can change our plans accordingly. Sometimes the plans work and other times they don't. But as long as the niyyah is correct, then inshallah everything will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With that, I bid you farewell. Please don't forget to join us on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook and on YouTube. Please don't forget to also send in your videos. Please remember us in your du'as and don't forget most importantly, to pray for the reappearance of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. Insha'Allah we will join you again tomorrow for another episode of the Ramadan show. Until then, wassalamu alaikum, jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.